Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. Today, we are discussing what two major acquisitions tell us about the state of AI competition. All right, friends, we are back with the first main episode of the AI Daily Brief of 2026. And you might have heard a few days ago, me drop my two episode set about my AI predictions for the next year. Before the proverbial ink was dry on that episode, one or kind of maybe even two of them had already started to come to pass. I'm talking, of course, about the prediction that the first leading crop of generalist AI agent companies, specifically GenSpark and Manus, were going to be massive acquisition targets for the big hyperscalers and labs in 2026. The logic was not about any sort of short-term need from GenSpark and Manus. Both of those companies were doing extremely well, seeing their revenue grow incredibly quickly, presumably having access to lots and lots of private capital. But at the same time, knowing that they were in a space that was going to be directly in the line of sight for all of the big labs. As the companies who are pushing the first generation of actually performant general purpose agents, they were in many ways softening the ground for the sort of interfaces and experiences that are presumably going to become a key part of what those major labs and current chatbots ultimately offer. Ultimately, my bet was and is that despite those companies racing to nine figures in ARR in just a number of months, they're still going to be staring down the barrel of competition so intense that I think it will make sense for them, from a strategic perspective, to get acquired by one of those partners. And obviously, I think from the perspective of the acquirers, getting all of that lived experience around how people are actually interacting with agents and what for is going to be worth effectively whatever price they pay for it. As it turns out, the first company to go was Manus. Just before the end of the year, news broke that Mark Zuckerberg's Meta would be buying Manus for more than $2 billion. Former scale leader, now Meta's chief AI officer, Alexander Wang, tweeted, Excited to announce that Manus has joined Meta to help us build amazing AI products. The Manus team in Singapore are world-class at exploring the capability overhang of today's models to scaffold powerful agents. Now, by way of background on Manus, you might remember that at the beginning of 2025, a number of people thought that Manus's launch was sort of the DeepSeek Moment 2.0. What I mean by that is that in January, when DeepSeek released their R1 model and their companion chatbot app to go with it, it really awoke people to the potential of Chinese labs as major competitors. A couple months later in March, Manus's first general purpose agent launch went completely viral, although it was nearly impossible to get an invite code. Building on that momentum, Manus raised money in April at a $500 million valuation, with the round being led by Benchmark, an investment that was somewhat controversial because of Manus's Chinese origins. Now, nine months on from that, Manus has proved that they were not just a hyped-up launch. In December, the company claimed a 125 million revenue run rate, and going from zero to 100 million in eight months, by some estimates, makes them the fastest growing startup of that scale in history. Now, it's very clear that in spite of all that, Manus's Chinese roots continue to loom large over the deal. Manus was originally launched out of offices in Beijing and Wuhan to a largely Western user base, and the company quickly relocated to Singapore to distance themselves from the US China AI conflict. Meta went to great length to get ahead of the issue, providing a statement that said, there will be no continuing Chinese ownership interest in Manus AI following the transaction, and Manus will discontinue its services and operations in China. Still, Manus' CEO is a Chinese national and will now take a prominent AI role at one of the largest US tech companies. From the Chinese perspective, the acquisition is a huge validation of the Chinese AI startup ecosystem. Li Jing, the founder of a Chinese startup incubator, told Bloomberg, this is truly an exhilarating event, a big era that belongs to China's startup founders. Entrepreneur Huang Dongshu, said, it's the best gift for the start of 2026. This is among the most significant news in recent times, a real boost for startup founders of Chinese ethnicity, especially those building businesses overseas. Tony Pang, the writer of the Recode China AI newsletter, suggested that Manus has created a new playbook for Chinese-founded startups, writing, this isn't just another normal acquisition story. It's a blueprint for how a new generation of Chinese entrepreneurs can build world-class AI products, win over global capital and tech companies, and execute a clean exit. It's also a microscope through which we can observe the latest dynamics of U.S.-China AI competition, where talent and technology flows across borders even as geopolitical walls rise higher. Po Zhao wrote, China trains AI users but exports AI founders. Manus just became the latest proof. In another tweet, he wrote, The question everyone in Chinese tech is asking, what if Manus had stayed instead of relocating to Singapore? The answer is uncomfortable but clear. In China's AI app market, big tech controls 70% of the top 20. ByteDance launched 11 AI products in 2024 alone. When a startup's product goes viral, incumbents clone it in days. Manus relocated 40 core engineers to Singapore. The move was a survival decision. The Singapore relocation gave Manus something critical, defensible traction. That's what Meta valued. 
Now, holding aside the geopolitical dimension of this, the more interesting questions to me, frankly, are about the product itself and what it means for Meta's strategy. The product will continue to operate, with Meta CEO Xiao Hong stating, Joining Meta allows us to build on a stronger, more sustainable foundation without changing how Manus works or how decisions are made. Tech analyst Rahar Jark wrote, Meta has just opened the floodgate for the AI agentic application layer. He goes on to argue that Manus is more than just an LLM wrapper. Manus, unlike ChatGPT, he writes, was built to execute tasks rather than provide text answers. The goal is to assign it a high-level task so the agent can navigate different tasks autonomously to complete the job. The unique part, is that instead of just talking about a problem, Manus writes a Python script on the fly to solve it, executes that script in a secure sandbox, and looks at the result. Now, in this way, it actually brings up another one of my predictions of Meta re-entering the AI competition conversation in a big way this year. Basically, my argument was that if 2025 was a rebuilding year with the recruitment of the superintelligence team and the changes to how AI was organized internally, we were going to see in 2026 the manifestation of that strategy come to the fore. Now, I don't think it's exactly clear what part of this whole pie Meta is going to go after. But perhaps with this Manus acquisition, we're starting to get a picture of what that might look like. Rahard again continues, This best fits into Meta's WhatsApp as an assistant that they can offer both to consumers and businesses, and a strong play for their Meta Ray-Ban smart glasses where you need an autonomous agentic system to run those glasses. Ben Palladian writes, Manus wasn't a vibes hire, it's capability overhang to scaffolding to real agents. This is how chatbots turn into labor. And I think some people's interpretation is that this is going to be meta moving more into the enterprise and getting work done side of things. But I'm not so sure. I think first Mark's Matt Turk is a little closer when he writes, if you're Amazon, you need your Manus. If you're Shopify, you need your Manus. If you're Bookings, you need your Manus. If you're a big consumer and commerce brand and don't own a major LLM, you need to build or acquire an agent because consumer intent is going away from consumer apps. And so the point here is what I'm using Manus's general purpose capabilities for right now, i.e. building slide presentations and things like that, is probably not what Meta is interested in using Manus for in the future. To the extent that Matt is right and consumer intent is moving away from consumer apps, and we will increasingly in the future be deploying agents on our behalf to do the things that we do now around e-commerce and interacting financially on the internet, this is a way for Meta to build the next generation way that its billions of users continue to use it as their starting point for everything that touches commerce on the internet. Sean Chahan writes, Meta didn't pay $2 billion for Manus' technology. They paid for eight months of distribution proof. OpenAI has better models, Anthropic has better reasoning, but neither owns a workflow where 3 billion people already live. The agent war won't be won in benchmarks, it will be won in the apps users refuse to leave. Distribution is the new moat. Model quality is table stakes. I don't think we know exactly how it's going to play out yet. I don't even think that Meta necessarily knows. I just think that they knew that general purpose agents are going to be an increasingly important part of not just the AI battle, but the internet landscape in general. And that by buying Manus for what is ultimately an incredibly cheap price, frankly, they were going to get a massive head start in this essential area. Now, the second big story of the break period was also an acquisition, and this one happened just before Christmas. Well, technically it's a licensing deal, but honestly, it's an acquisition. Let's be clear. I'm talking, of course, about NVIDIA agreeing to a licensing deal, with the biggest air quotes you can possibly imagine, with chipmaker Grok, paying them $20 billion for the use of their technology and the acquisition of several key executives. Grok, which is spelled with a Q, not to be mistaken to Elon Musk's chatbot Grok with a K, is a decade-old chip startup. The company was founded by former Google executive Jonathan Ross, who helped invent Google's TPU chip architecture. He took that knowledge to Grok and focused on producing high-speed inference chips. Now, at this stage, Grok has carved out a small market share, largely producing chips for NeoCloud, servicing customers with specific latency needs. Their chips aren't necessarily better than NVIDIA's general-purpose GPUs, but they can be as much as 10 times faster at producing tokens during inference. Jonathan Ross is among the executives who will be joining NVIDIA, leaving Grok to continue as an independent company. That means, of course, that NVIDIA will now have the creator of the TPU in-house working on inference optimization. It's also not exactly clear how much of a company will be left over once the deal is closed, but despite initial concerns that this is going to be another deal where the top executives get a major payday and the employees get left in a lurch, it appears that that actually won't be the case. Axios's Dan Primack tweeted, Been a bunch of chatter about how Grok employees made out in the NVIDIA deal. Made some calls to find out, in short, very, very well, even if not fully vested. Specifically, it sounds like around 90% of Grok employees are said to be joining NVIDIA, and will be paid cash for all vested shares. 
Unvested shares will be paid out at the $20 billion valuation, but via NVIDIA stock that vests on its own schedule. So what is this acquisition about? Some of the early chatters suggested it was simply about NVIDIA snuffing out the competition. And I don't think in this case that that's really accurate. At $20 billion, it's the largest acquisition in NVIDIA's history, and large enough to rank as a top 15 tech acquisition. It's roughly similar in size to the WhatsApp, Slack, and LinkedIn acquisitions. The sheer size of the deal has Wall Street concerned. Given that it was framed as a non-exclusive licensing agreement, that raised a lot of red flags for investors who were already concerned about NVIDIA's valuation. NVIDIA's stock struggled over holiday trading sessions, suggesting that there isn't very much enthusiasm for the deal. Still, UBS nailed their colors to the mast and reiterated their buy rating for NVIDIA just before the new year. They wrote that the deal, while coming at a substantial price tag, could, quote, bolster NVIDIA's ability to service high-speed inference applications, an area where GPUs are not ideally suited because of all the off-chip high-bandwidth memory. This would also be one of the fastest-growing parts of the inference market, and we see this as another pivot to offering ASIC-like architectures in addition to its mainstream GPU roadmap. Now, despite this being technical, it's worth unpacking just a little bit. NVIDIA's GPUs are reliant on high-bandwidth memory, which is currently experiencing a price spike due to global memory shortage. Grok's architecture, on the other hand, utilizes less costly SRAM and allows NVIDIA to offer a completely different product. Effectively, the more mature that AI gets, the more that different workloads have different types of needs that can be optimized by different types of chips. The architecture of Grok's chips is extremely relevant for things like low-latency applications, i.e. the sort of general purpose agent interactions we were talking about before with the Manus acquisition, where people don't want to be sitting around waiting for a response, they want to be interacting as though the agent is actually an agent working on their behalf, as well as potentially being relevant for other types of applied AI contexts, like edge devices running smaller models, and eventually lower power chips to put inside robots and embodied AI. There also is potentially a virtuous cycle. Here's Grok CEO Jonathan Ross. NVIDIA will sell every single GPU they make for training. Right now, about 40% of their you know, market is inference. If we were to deploy a lot of much lower cost inference chips, what you would see is that same number of GPUs would be sold, but the demand for training would increase because the more inference you have, the more training you need and vice versa. You can almost say we're one of the best things that's ever happened to NVIDIA because they can make every single GPU that they were gonna make and they can sell it for training, high margin, right? Gets amortized across the deployment. And, you know, we'll take the low margin, high volume inference business off their hands and they won't have to sell either margin. As Sumjeet sums up, when Grok floods the market with cheap inference chips, everyone's going to need way more training to feed all that inference capacity. It's a perfect cycle. More inference equals more training needed. Anyways, guys, for my money, those are the two biggest stories from the holiday period. But of course, we are just at the beginning of the year and I expect a lot more to happen in very short order. For now, that is going to do it for this first episode of the AI Daily Brief of 2026. Appreciate you listening or watching as always. And until next time, peace.